Hey guys, welcome back to Real Housewives Recaps. Today, we're doing some commentary. We got Michael Patrick King. This is part two of Change of Address, season four, episode 15. So we left off with Aiden is breaking down the wall between the two apartments, which is very fitting and metaphorical for this episode, trying to break down Carrie's walls, but we know how Carrie is. We know how this episode goes. Let's take a listen to see what else Michael Patrick King has to say about what's going on. Or find me on Patreon. It's patreon.com backslash Real Housewives Recaps. This is a bit of a cheat, but we decided that if she looked up and saw all bride magazines that the audience would get it. Some days you just have those kind of the world against you days. Later, while Aiden worked on the apartment next door, I worked on reprogramming my attitude. Could I be a spring bride? The building of the brides and the breaking of the wall is something that we were very, very happy about. The representation that that's happening to her world, that there's a big hole in it. I hate this scene so much. Listen, I understand that she is allowed to not marry him and feel the way she feels. Fine. But this is so Carrie to not speak up about it, expect him to read her mind, and make it completely about Carrie who cares what anybody else wants, right? So she waits till the last second when it's too late and he's literally busting through the wall and she's like, stop, stop. It's just, <laughs> it just... I find it so obnoxious and so very carry. The set design on this is amazing because it was very important to everyone that this be as realistic as possible, that there is another apartment, that he is breaking through, that they do own it. I'm having a, a very strong reaction to all this change. Okay, okay, just I can't. Don't I, freak out. I am freaking out. It all just feels really fast. The hole? I, I told you I was going to come through there today. It's not just the hole. Just imagine it the other way around, where Carrie and Aiden had set up this life together. They had gotten engaged and were living together and planning all these things. And then Aiden all of a sudden says, stop, stop. It's too much. It's too much. Like Big used to do to her, basically. It just, it, I think it, I don't know. It, it would shine a light on how obnoxious the character is. Performances that are just so kind of, real and surprising I love you and I'm sorry if I'm not supposed to talk to you about this but but I have to hey hey come here there's two images Snow. in this I particularly love one is a bead of sweat that falls off Aiden the idea that he's really sweating what's happening and this, she can't say it, but look at the way the ring just says it for her. The problem is this. I didn't want to say anything. Just swinging and swinging. But then that thing came through my wall. It's like a smoking gun. A little off guard here. One of the I things know. we try to do with our scripts is show points of view where the characters actually express the fact that they don't know what to say. Like life, people actually need moments to get it together, and they don't just have a quick, clever line coming up. I said we could get Maui'd. <laughs> huh? Thank you for making a joke. One of the things that they did really well, Julie and Elisa wrote this scene, is that they really showed this sort of moment-to-moment -moment thinking out of the transitional process here between these two. Six months? Cheers. Aiden knows how big this problem is, and from here on, we let him be a little bit in denial. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's him telling himself he can handle this. Thank you, Aiden. Thank you for listening. When Sarah Jessica looks at him and searches with those eyes, it always amazes me that she is drinking him in. She's... Quite amazing, I think. So if this is your first episode of listening, first of all, I'm so sorry. Second of all, <laughs> this is a thing that Michael Patrick do King does every single time. He has to kiss Sarah Jessica Parker's ass like you've never seen. And um, yeah, like that right there. She's so brave. That's like his favorite thing to say about her. She's so brave.
and her cleaning lady. Another reoccurring theme in the show is Miranda's law school cup, same one that's been in the show. It's been featured like four times. It's beautiful. Did they tell you, boy or girl? We wanted to show yet another example of how Miranda is pressured into this. And also we wanted to begin to set up the fact that we were going to have Magda become more of a significant element in Miranda and the baby's life. Smile to a boy. A boy! Just the idea that the sonogram stepped on rather than the reverence of the sonogram. And while Miranda had T for one, Charlotte was mastering T for two. That is Andre De Shields, one of the foremost tap dancers, performers on Broadway. Kristen really is hilarious here, partly because she's really tapping. Okay, so in this scene, of course, they're playing that, was it Tea for Two song, and Charlotte's tap dancing. She's supposed to find a partner. She has her breakdown. I can't play this part because they actually play the song and it's copywritten. So, moving along. What I love in this is the silence of the taps. In her attempt to skip over her grief, Charlotte tapped into her pain. And that we stay on it so long so you really feel what hell she's in. The next week, we all Every now and then we decide to do something that's like, like, let's do a little glamour. So we decided if there's a big party, let's make it a really glamorous party and make it a black and white ball. The reason we made it a black and white ball is because we secretly wanted to get Carrie in a bride gown, something white. Because we wanted to get Aiden in a tux and her in a bride gown so that we could play out the end of this relationship with them looking like they could be married, but emotionally being unable to be there. In a formal gown with an elasto waist, I really fit in here. Do you realize you're growing a teeny Those earrings are really special to Sarah Jessica. She wore them the year she wore the Golden Globes. They're her good luck earrings. When she showed up on the set with those earrings on, I knew that this was an important scene for her. The whole feel of this party feels very millennium madcap. It feels like the updated version of something you'd see the Marx Brothers and Gene Harlow do. And it even gets more of a slapsticky feel later when Samantha chases down that woman. So just a reminder, this is the black and white ball. I know it's, we can't see it, so you just have to remember. Um, it was a reason to get Carrie in a white dress, right? To get her by the fountain with Aiden. But also, Samantha was upset because they kept showing Richard in the paper canoodling with B.B. London. And she wanted to be the only one canoodling Richard. Every day, millions of people suffer from monogamy. We wanted to create that madcap millennium 30s, present day, Gene Harlow craziness, and we did it there, I think. Hey, gorgeous, great turnout. This is purely professional. <gasps> exactly how many women are you fucking? Just as we had an interesting journey trying to figure out how Miranda would be a pregnant woman, our journey was just as interesting to try to figure out how Samantha would be a woman in love. Both fish out of water. It makes you nervous too. As your publicist? Yes, it does. So, grow up, stop fucking other women, just fuck me. <laughs> Come on, we're not the monotonous, I mean monogamous type. Well, maybe I am. Gorgeous. I'm not. Fine. Hey, Jonesy, you getting a good dish for me? In fact, she did. This so scene is very interesting because we found when we were in editing that if you got on too close, it wasn't as funny as that shot, which is just completely wide. It is hilarious. It wasn't the first time a guy went soft on Samantha, but it was the first time she didn't care. Oh, Jonesy, I can't believe this is happening. Now, this here's a little sex in the city of trivia. In most movies or television happened. shows, whenever anyone gives a phone number, they always have to do the 555. We hated that so much as writers that we purchased two phone numbers and we used them repeatedly throughout. Listen, maybe I was too quick back there. If there's anyone who could keep monotony interesting. The fun of this for us was that Samantha lays down a gauntlet, he shows up and decides he could change for her, and she's blown it. Not literally. 
Ugh, everything Michael Patrick King says is creepy. She's blown it, not literally. <laughs> um, so remember, this is JJ, the reporter that had written about Richard Canoodling. Also, we saw JJ in an ep- episode in, uh, gosh, was it season three, I believe, when he calls Charlotte Sweet Lips. Ugh. This scene is very interesting to me because it was originally written to be a scene on the street outside of the hotel where they were. Alan Taylor, the director, had a different vision. He wanted it to be the ultimate in romance, the ultimate in New York. So he wanted to do it in front of a fountain. I was very, very concerned that if they had this very intense, little intimate scene in front of a big fountain, that somehow they'd be upstaged. But in the last minute, I went with his instincts, and I just am so glad I did, because the scene is electric in its imagery, and there in front of this incredibly opulent romantic fountain in this beautiful romance setting, they're having the most unromantic conversation that we could come up with. What about what we discussed? Ah, oh, come on, you're just scared. Yes, I'm scared. Come on, Aiden, we talked about this. No, you talked, and I listened. Carrie, I looked at you tonight from across the room, and... The sense that... And I thought, I love her. John's playing Aiden here like he's had a couple of champagnes, and he's now allowing himself to have his feelings. What's going to change? This is me. I don't have any tricks up my sleeve. This is who I am. This isn't about you. It's always a debate in the writing room as to people who are on Aiden's side, people who are on Carrie's side, because we think that's the way the audience feels. Half of the audience will understand Aiden's point of view, maybe men, maybe men and women, and the other half of the audience might understand Carrie's point of view, the non-traditional point of view. So we had to make sort of a foolproof argument for both of them, and what we needed Aiden to do in this scene was to push Carrie so that the audience could feel for her. Like, don't try to hold her, she'll just try to get away. Maybe you need to be pushed. What's the big deal? It's just a stupid piece of paper. If it's just a stupid piece of paper, then why do we need it? Because I need it! This is the place where we showed Aiden was less than perfect, that he was insecure and that he needed proof. Okay, I sound really negative about this episode. I actually like this episode, even though I have a lot of negative things to say about Michael Patrick King. Um, I did love the way this scene looks. I thought it was really pretty. I love her dress. Of course, I always love Aiden. I hate her hair. That's just beside the point. Remember, it's like tied up in a roll or like a gladiator look on top of her head. I didn't love that. Okay, um... I just, I still don't, it's still a carry worship for this guy, right? So it was written that, even the way he's talking, he's saying this is a moment of showing Aiden's not perfect. But yet, I mean, do you blame the guy for being insecure? She cheated on him before. <laughs> and and isn't this again, like, kind of mirroring the Carrie big of it all? Carrie was insecure the whole time. And yet Michael Patrick King didn't call her... What imperfect and, and uh, I don't know, call it a flaw, I guess. But here he is. So, I don't know. Oh, my God. The reference there, of course, in the silence is that she cheated on him with Mr. Big, and maybe that's where her heart really is. Half the audience didn't believe her. Half the audience probably thought she was with Mr. Big. I love you, but I can't marry you to make you trust me. Look at, Look at her eyes. Look at me before we make a huge mistake. If you don't want to marry me right now, you'll never want to marry me. That's not true. I think it is. Yeah. There's a line coming up that John says that we had cut from the version of the script we were filming. And on the very last take, he remembered it and put it back in. And I'm so glad he did. Can't believe I'm back here again. That line. 
And her reaction to it is totally spontaneous, like she's been punched in the stomach. It's just one of those lines that we cut because we thought we don't really need it. And then John thought, now Aiden's got to say that. We had left the land of black and white, and now everything was gray. To the outside world, Miranda's maternal This is a testament to Cynthia. Here. Going from the heart, I don't feel anything, to that moment of wonder. I love that Carrie's just laying in bed with her hand on the necklace. We tried really hard to end this storyline with a realistic, grown-up respect for each other. And so we came up with the idea that they sleep together, even though they're not going to be together. There are some walls you can push through, and some you can't. The very last line of voiceover was taken out, put back in, taken out, put back in. We, we finally left it in because we wanted the audience to feel like they were drop-kicked. That is so Michael Patrick King to say something like that, that he wanted us to feel like we were drop-kicked. I would say that's probably the same emotion he seems to be going for and just like that, because that's how I left feeling. Um, so th basically, again, he talked through it. We can't see it. What happened was, of course, Carrie got out of bed in the middle of the night. Aiden was sleeping at the other apartment. She climbs in bed, or it's like a bed on the floor with him. And in a voiceover, we find out the very last line Aiden moved out the next day. And that was it for their relationship, and I hate it so much. I hate how that ended. I understand that she couldn't be with him, but... Ugh. Anyway, so that's how that episode ends. That's it for the commentary. Let me know your thoughts below. Thanks so much for sticking with me. Thanks for listening, and I hope you guys have the best day. I will talk to you again very soon. Take care. Bye-bye.